will we will start um, without further further ado with our um, dear guest here, Trevor Fossey, who's a patient whose life has been transformed by technology, and he's here to share uh, his story with us. And um, we're um, honoured to have you here. Thank you very much for um, uh, um, uh, sparing your time to to join us here today. And uh, please, can you um, come and uh, join us at the front and um, give your talk? Thank you very much. Sorry, I forgot to mention, um, Twitter, we, we do have a, a Twitter hashtag, but it's wrong, the one that you're saying, seeing there. It's actually PCS underscore underscore 2017. So if you, if you want to join the um, Twitter lot, please by all means do. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. Um, can everyone hear me? I've got one of these special microphones, the ones that politicians forget to switch off. So if you hear anything you're not supposed to hear, uh, you, you know, tell me afterwards. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for um, letting, you give, uh, letting me give you uh, how I've used technology, coming from the background I had um, with my own health and well-being. And I'm going to cover this in three particular areas. My co I've got uh, 20 minutes, but I'll be shot if I go over, as I've been told, because I don't want to go you know, over the time. But I'm going to give you a, a short personal um, introduction about how I've got involved and how it's helped me. Um, I'm Trevor Fossey. I live in Sandwell, so I made a trip across the border to Birmingham for this event. Um, but basically, I've, I've not been involved in health before, apart from being as a patient. I had a stroke in 2008 and another one in 2010, which left me with um, some issues with mobility. Um, but I have used with that since retirement, got involved in a bit of technology on a personal level, and it has enhanced my health. So I'll be covering that. Then I'll go on to the current situation with NHS England GP online program and explain how that has helped me and uh, what is health is happening there. And also then a de development of a patient-centered technology via co-production. I was pleased to hear in the introduction that many of you do use the patients, but I feel that, as you'll see, the culture, I think, needs to be changed a bit. And my main purpose of being here is sharing, sharing it so that I, I feel everyone should have the benefit of being able to have um, an improvement in enhancing their own health and well-being. So we go on to the first section first. I'm, I'm, I was thinking in putting this together, what are the main differences and similarities that I've got with, with you guys? The, the, the main differences, I suppose, well, I notice there's quite a few other patients here. Who are the other um, PIP or patient representatives here? Okay. The main differences are that I'm not a provider in the health industry. I'm not trying to share anything. I'm just saying what I've used. And I'm retired. I could be at home cutting the lawn, but it's going to rain, so I thought I'd come here instead. Um, the main similarities, though, we all have an NHS number. We all are um, registered with a NHS GP. We all have been patients or have members and family who are patients, so we've all had an experience. And we all use digital and social media um, for banking, um, Twitter, shopping. Um, we all use them. And there's one other similarity. We all have online access to our own GP records. How many people actually use access to their records? That's two of us. Well done. Um, I can go in to see a doctor. I can then go home and look at the screen and see what he said. I can remind myself. I can look up any conditions. So that 10-minute chat doesn't disappear 
following day or a week later, I can take control myself of my own health. But we've all got that facility. Only 10% or so of GPs provide it at the moment, but 100% do provide it, and it's a GP online. And I explain how that has been used to help my own health. My own personal journey, background, as I said, I retired in 2014. I'd had a couple of strokes, and I'd been diagnosed with diabetes in 2008. I probably had it beforehand, like most diabetes type 2 in 2008, and high cholesterol and blood pressure. Um, and then I found out about something called um, the Power of Information initiative by the coalition government that said all patients, everybody, not only patients, um, would have online access to their own health and social care records. That was the name. By 2015, they'd do that. So I phoned up in... I already had access to my online descriptions and appointments that was being provided, but to actually be able to see my records, I thought that's powerful. In my own working life, I've been a quality manager, and so information is power and getting people engaged. Um, like the banking, you know, who goes into a bank these days? We just go online and sort it out. Um, so I, I registered with GP for online prescription, online booking, and in 2013, I, I phoned up my GP and said, I'm going to have access to my record. Can you tell me when it's going to happen? And he said, I don't know about it. Um, so he said, why don't you join the patient group and put it on the agenda, which was a very positive. So I went on to the patient, made sure it was on the patient agenda, and then in 2014, I actually got access to my own record. I was able to go and see a GP, and it worked in, in about March 2014 when I said to my company I, I was having difficulty coping, so I thought I needed to talk about retirement. It, it was a big stage in life. I went to the GP, and he said to me at the end, I think you're depressed. I was able to go home, though. I didn't think I was, but I was able to go home and analyse it and spent about two hours, three hours on the computer analysing it, looking it up. Why does he think that? What is it? And as I'll show the record, that it, it, it helped me come to terms and help to deal with it. So I resolved that without any medication, without anything, and that was the first stage on the mental health benefit. Um, I was active in the patient working together group because from, which was an NHS England type of group, to help spread the word of the benefits. And then um, I got a diabetic ulcer on the foot. It got me more activated. I started using the records more. And now I'm promoting that. What has actually happened, the benefits, are that it enhanced my outcome regarding depression. And in uh, diabetes type 2 in October, I had a blood test that showed that I'd reversed type 2 diabetes, and my cholesterol and my blood pressure were at normal range. And I hadn't been taking the medication because of the side effects. So it wasn't the medication. It was actually getting actively involved in my own record and feeling I had a bit of control. I had permission to have control to look at my records. So good experience, the result, as I said. This is a part of my, or what was actually put as a coded entry that I was able to go home and read. I, I noticed on the schedule there's a few doctors in here. So if, any doctors notice anything different? I'm getting a second opinion, please, if you notice anything that I need. But uh, that's what the GP wrote. It's very much what he told me. I've been told when I asked about records and saying, well, you won't understand them. I, I'd say anyone could understand that. And I was able to find an app. I can't find it now. It's, it's been taken off. But doing the BEX schedule of depression, um, I actually went through the whole schedule, answered the multi-choice questions, and I thought, hey, GB could be right, there's signs there. So I thought, well, what can I go through those questions again? What can I change in my life? I control my life to actually um, do something about it. And I uh, assessed, coming up to retirement, I was going to miss involvement, and I thought, well, if I get involved with uh, patient activity, then, hey, that will suit me. And, and it's worked on that basis. 
Um, physical health, 19th October, I had a blood test, went in, and the GP immediately cancelled six medications, straight away. All to do with, and, and those that have got medical background will know that those are all to do with um, sort of diabetes type 2 and, and um, blood pressure and cholesterol. Didn't need them anymore. From that day, stopped. I hadn't been taking them anyway, but hey, that's between you and me. You know. <laughs> um, what helped? I, I, I was able to, um, there was an app that um, the Birmingham Hospitals Trust, in, uh, Birmingham, whichever hospital it was, on the blood tests actually um, give me a, a schedule of what there is there because on the patient online record, it doesn't give any trends and templates and things like that. So I was able to find one that gave it. And that was very visual, so that I had blood pressure or, or um, blood sugar level of about 80 at the worst stage. It went down to around 60, and they said I was doing quite well, but make a little bit more effort. And then um, the last one was at 43, it's a normal range. And that was the motivation that technology and having access and giving me access to control has actually given me. Um, what it does also, it's allowed me to check the accuracy of the record. Apparently, uh, prior to my stroke, I'd been into the doctor to see about asthma. I hadn't. But the GP record said it, and that would be recorded on there. Um, it reviewed the template of notes and it helps understand the test results. Unfortunately, the, um, and this is how the, an example of not listening to patients, I would say, is that I, my um, GP uses TPP system one. They had a process where the blood test results came there. You click on one of the um, hyperlinks and it give you a link to blood tests online that would tell you um, what, how the test is used, what it's for, and give you the results. It gave you control. But that's disappeared now. They haven't got their hyperlink anymore, so I don't know what they're doing. They're not listening to patients. Um, and the need to listen to patients, what patients fi find useful. Um, so basically, that is a situation where it can be used. I've also, another measure you might have heard of is, and I'll relate it to this because I think it's very important, of something called PAM, patient activation measure. It's something that uh, NHS England have purchased the license for, passed it out to some CCGs. Um, and basically, it recognizes that there are four levels of patient activation. Again, the emphasis being put on the patient action rather than on the provider action. I think that I went probably from level one, level two, and I was probably going to stay there. And at level four, it recognizes that people need support to um, keep their habits and, and uh, their, their steps they've taken. And I think that the final step is that actual giving patients or people a feeling of control of their own health, like they have of money. And just as an aside, uh, the control, that blood test that told me that I was at 43, um, I went for a blood test at the local hospital at 11 in the morning, at two o'clock in the afternoon, I got an email saying, here's all your results. That's how it should be. When you get a salary, for example, you don't, you don't, um, let's go back one. You, you don't phone up your bank and say, is my salary in? And they say, yeah, it's in, it's about normal, nothing to worry about. <laughs> you know, would you accept that from your bank? So why do we accept it for health, for blood tests? Should be, should be easy. I'll go on to now um, to the current situation. Uh, NSA England have changed it from um, uh, into GP online program, um, online services. And there's a lot of information. I've put a lot of information about online services in the envelope that's on your chair. Um, it tells you how to register. It tells you that you can go in and register. You can get family and friends to register. You can, particularly, I think is important, 
um, use technology, or people who are big use users of technology, is to get younger people to register. It can help tackle obesity. At the moment, you've got a situation where NHS England or your doctor or whatever has had the culture where they tell you, you know, you eat five a day, you watch your, what you drink and smoke if you ever smoke, uh, you know, you take exercise. We trust you to do that. And then you say to them, well, can I see my records? They say, oh, we don't trust you with those. But hey, there's a dichotomy. And if youngsters know that, the doctor might tell them they're eating too much. They'll start getting involved. They'll look at notes. They'll do their own research. And they might come to terms because it isn't the health services telling people that they are being controlled. They're saying, you've got control for yourself. So you've got, there is a culture of not trusting the patients. There has been a culture. Um, you know, they, 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 some share the information. Even mine, my GP, when, when I got access to my records, said, well, we're only going to give it from January 2014. Can't go retrospective, can't look at old records. Why? But I, I, one patient said to me, well, he'd like to see old records. I said, don't knock it. We've got a culture change, a huge culture change. And culture is really, a, a, on a personal basis, my personal view from being uh, my own involvement in quality is just a habit. And the habit has been to hide information, to not sh fully share it. And I believe that if, if, and what's helped with me, is that by feeling in control of my own information and access to my own information, it has helped me. It's improved my well-being and, and my health. Um, there's too much paternalism, I think, in the in the um, health and social care areas. And the, uh, oops, keep on clicking it. Um, and we've got to make it easier for patients. If anything happened to me now, I've got my health record on here. And it's up to date, I haven't downloaded it because that, that would be a second copy. It can go onto the health record and show it. I went through customs, um, some self-security check and I was asked what are these pills that was when I was still taking pills or had them in your bag and I was able to tap in my phone and say there you are didn't need paper so you can order repeat prescriptions but the main thing is to access your record online um, be beneficial for the health service because patients are one of the biggest underused resources for their own health I personally saved the NHS money with that medication disappearing. Um, and, and there are fewer errors because there's only one person who knows what's in your record is right. And that's you. No one's going to check it. Um, suppliers, you possibly know who the suppliers are with EMIS, TPP, um, MT and I, INPS. But of the 8,000 or 7,600 GPs, that all are all registered now. They can all provide you with your health record, provide new ask words. Um, but it's not, it's been produced on systems that are by clinicians for clinicians. So it, it isn't that intuitive. That's part of me actually talking today. And we're going towards a digital tool revolution, but basically it will help change the culture. That's what I'm trying to do that other people should receive the same benefit and there are some guys in there I've put a load NHS England let me have a load of up-to-date guides that are in the envelope how to do it um, you can see information there and there is a patient-centered model what patients are looking for as a generality for patient online one thing that I've tended to get involved in in sharing the message as well is something called coalition for Cl um, collaborative care and you've got a card in your envelope about that. And it's a group of carers and organizations with the, um, and patients with long-term conditions and living well with long-term conditions and looking at how to get in engagement. Apps are a key engagement, the different apps that are coming up and co-production models. There is in your, um, and it'd be interesting for you guys to actually look at this when you, um, you know, consider it when you say you've had patients' input. 
the co-production group um, developed a model. You've all got that in your bag. Seven steps and five values of co-production. I've actually adapted it a bit and put on the back um, bullet points to show as evidence that you're actually getting them involved. How many of those steps are you actually achieving? Or is engagement a bit like uh, my own CCG that said, um, oh, we have engagement, we've got full engagement because we hold a, a, a sort of public um, event that tell them what we've done. That's engagement. Okay, it's just get them involved. And there's value in that. They can say how it's going to work. So it's used in various projects um, and looking for case studies. So if anybody's got any good case studies, and I'll, I'll be here looking for some, I want to, we're using the um, Coalition for Collaborative Care to gather this ev evidence to share it, to get, change the culture of patients as well, of people, of citizens who use the NHS to feel that they've got permission to give, provide an input. So co-production is just using service users in an equal par partnership. It's not just telling them what's happened. And th there is, within the model, this is it's actually um, is a summary of what's in the model. Um, it actually then has got the five values. I won't go through them because of time constraints. And um, how we can do it with the various steps to actually achieve co-production. I'm really asking you, if you can as well, if any of you think you've got good co-production model, fill in the bullet points on the back and let me have it. We want to share it, good co-production. And by sharing, and that's the basis of what I, I used to do when I, before I retired, sharing, you get the best practice, you get good information, you get it, it, it's being developed well. So a suggested action and goals for you. I've got a model up here of health and diet and whatever you can, can have that. The electronic copy of this um, is, will be available or it can be made available. But actually feel control of your own health because by having the information of their health, you've got it. And accept responsibility for your own well-being. Become empowered, get access to your own record so that next time, if I'm given the privilege of asking again, a whole host of hands will go up with that first question, how many have got access to their own record? Um, and set goals for yourself if you need to and realize the benefits for your friends, friends and family. But, you know, get people engaged because emp empowerment will, uh, will save resources within the NHS and I'd ask you to all embrace co the true co-production against the model. And on the basis of suggestions, if you've got suggestions of if the model needs enhancing at all, I'd be very pleased to hear them. So that's, that's my message. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, any questions for Trevor? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, he will be uh, around for the whole day, so if you've got any questions, uh, you, you can grab him at, at the break or at lunchtime. Um, so um, I'm going to quickly move on to the uh, first company presentation. I did remember one of the um, uh, things that I wanted to mention to you, and, uh, we, and it's about recording the event. We're actually recording the event right now, and um, we're going to take out um, the, the, the main parts of the presentations and put a video together for... Uh, other members of the staff in the trust and hopefully board members to also see uh, all the presentations from today. So uh, I just thought I'd mention that to you as well. So if, if anyone's um, not consenting to be filmed, um, please make that clear to us, um, to either um, Shirley or Sel Sabil at the back, and uh, we'll, we'll take that into account. So um, <coughs> our first presentation, it's uh, from Memrika. Is that correct, Mary? isn't it? So I'll just uh, put that one up. I can't see it. Didn't, didn't, no. 
Mary, can I borrow you for a second? Because I can't see this. <laughs> it's not in the list. I'll go to an email and ask what they possibly can. Okay. Okay, it looks like I've actually forgotten to put Mary's presentation here. Do you mind if we swap to yours with a later one? Sure. And we just, um, and, I, and then we don't have focus games here either, so I'm gonna move on to Sound Doctor if that's okay. And in the meantime, I'll get your presentation loaded onto the computer. Apologies, Mary, sorry about the hiccup. So can I have um, Sound Doctor, please, uh, do their presentation first? And here's the microphone. Thank you. So do you think your thing will work? Yeah, it works. Okay. So it's um, switched on. So it's got... Hello everyone. Okay, so the five minutes is starting. Thank you very much indeed. It was great to hear from you. And I, I'm sure all health professionals are thinking, oh, we so wish all patients were like Trevor. So um, empowerment is uh, a fantastic thing. And uh, the Sound doctor, doctor is all about empowering patients. Um, I'm going to just show you a very short film. Um, this is uh, who we are, and this is why we feel qualified to make films. So our background is BBC. Um, Dominic, who co-founded The Sound Doctor with me, was a Today programme reporter for 20 years and a Newsnight reporter, and had a couple of programmes on Radio 4, and I was editor of NewsHour and The World Today, amongst other things, and also worked on Today and 5 Live. So our... our uh, background is in making really high quality uh, content which uh, is engaging and which people want to listen to because the alternative is they turn off and then um, <laughs> we're out of a job so it has to be interesting and uh, I'm just going to show you if it works uh, this little film. The Sound Doctor has more than 280 films to help you learn more about your long-term condition and help you get the most out of life. So that's what it is, uh, and uh, as uh, we said there, there are about 300 films on long-term conditions. They're all about um, things you can do to help yourself. So there are lots of exercises, as you saw, lots of practical things. Um, so films in, in itself, you know, films are not an innovation. We certainly didn't innovate the, the film. But the point is that this is a proper educational journey. So there are up to 60 films for each condition. And it is very different from anything else which is on offer. We co-create them with all the major charities. We work with Diabetes UK, British Lung Foundation, British Heart Foundation, etc. We try to go to um, international experts uh, and uh, have very motivational patient stories. So um, these are people who most patients would not be fortunate enough to have advice from on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that sort of tells you the, the, the whole point about the, uh, the journey. Um, and so uh, it is, uh, adhere, they adhere to nice guidelines. 
and um, the, uh, they're all clinically reviewed. They are extremely well endorsed, and we've had uh, some very successful evaluations. So crucially, um, we know they work. We know they get patients to change behaviours. We know that there are reductions in avoidable hospital admissions, reductions in visits to GPs. And um, uh, as Trevor was talking about so powerfully, it does empower the patient because if you have a long-term condition, as so many people do now, you cannot look after yourself better without really good information. You just, you, it's just not possible. Um, and to know where that information is and to avoid people Googling, uh, in, in our heart failure films, one of the heart specialists um, has a lovely quote. He says his top tip to patients is, whatever you do, do not Google heart failure. That is the most important thing. So um, I think I, w I won't finish, because I know we're very short for time now, so I won't finish the rest of the presentation. All I want to say is, if come and see me. If you want me to email you evaluations and you want to uh, look at some of our uh, endorsements from the charities and from clinicians and patients, I can send all those to you. Um, and uh, I, I hope you'll come and see us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosie. So we're going to have to keep the questions for the break times and lunch time, if that's okay. So um, the next one is um, Anne Frampton from um, University Hospital Bristol. Uh, she's going to talk to us about the Happy App. Hi there, um, thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting us to come and talk today. Um, now you'll see that our title is Staff Feedback rather than Patient Feedback, but I hope you'll, you'll understand uh, as I go through this how, how we think, think this fits in quite nicely. Uh, my name's Anne Frampton, I'm a consultant in emergency medicine um, at University Hospitals Bristol. Um, but I'm here on behalf of a company and myself and one of the other consultants set up um, working with UH Bristol to develop uh, a real-time staff feedback application. So um, we heard uh, just now from uh, the f our first speaker that um, patients and information are the most underutilized um, things in the NHS. Well, actually, I, w I would argue that information from staff is also quite underutilized within the NHS. So we know that people come to work to do a good job, and we know that happy, engaged staff provide uh, better patient care. Um, but we also know that actually, if you go to the front line and you ask people who care for patients on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and by that we include everybody, so porters, cleaners, NAs, consultants, junior doctors, nursing staff, so absolutely everybody, they will be able to tell you what works, what doesn't work, what's going wrong, what's going right, um, and actually provide a really on the mo in the moment um, idea of what's going on, uh, almost like a smoke detector of you know, what's going well and what, what's working, what isn't. So that was the problem that we set out to look at. How do you capture information from staff on the front line about what works and what doesn't work? And so we devised um, with staff, so we, we did workshops with the staff in our trust, we devised a real-time patient feedback system. Um, and it's very, in, on the face of it, it's very simple. So staff can, any member of staff, can put in how they're feeling and why they're feeling it. Uh, they do this at work. It's only accessible within the trust. You can't get onto it at home. Um, they do it at work and they describe what's going well, what's not going less well, what they think improvement, what they think the improvements could be, um, and, uh, and whether they think there's things that uh, are not working. Um, these are themed, so uh, you can put against things like team working, against um, uh, patient care, against patient flow, um, and it allows you to benchmark across uh, different areas within the trust. It allows you to pull out themes and ideas. Um, and we see people use it for all sorts of things. So we see them using it for quick fix it, so we haven't got enough thermometers, actually why do we always run out of pillows? Um, to suggest, so bigger suggestions for improvement. We can run, we can run uh, quality improvement projects from the ideas that go into it, but all the way through to things like uh, uh, team working and interprofessional standards. Um, so we use it for all of those kind of things. So does it work? 
Well, there are lots of different ways to find out, I guess, whether or not this is a good idea or not. So the first one is, do staff use it? And the answer is yes. So we started this as a pilot in one single area within our trust. Um, it, we didn't try to spread it out, it spread organically, so staff asked to, to be included in it and to use it. It went from one area to 100 areas within a year. Um, we get 1,600 pieces of staff feedback every single month. Um, we've had over 16,000 in total so far. So staff use it and they use it all the time. Um, it allows you to see themes of what's going on across the trust um, and 50% of the feedback that goes into it is positive. So we see lots of uh, information about team working that goes in that's positive. But then the other things that are often sometimes less positive are the things you'd expect. So things around environment and equipment, but things that you can change and things that we can do something about and that are really important uh, in delivering good patient care. Uh, we've seen reductions in agency uh, and turnover of staff, um, and we've seen uh, an increase in morale in the areas that it's gone into. Uh, one of the most important um, measures is obviously the staff survey. Um, we can predict some of the things that are going to be in our staff survey because, um, because we see that people have been talking about it over the last year, so it allows you to actually do something about it before you find out at the end of the year. Um, the area that I've highlighted, I'm sorry, it doesn't come up terribly well on here, but that was the first area that this uh, went into, so it was the area that's been using it the longest. Um, if you look at all of the staff survey for this area, it's not all, all that green, so that staff in that area do feel like they're not a staff, they do feel like they don't always have enough resource, but in terms of do they feel listened to, do they feel like they're empowered, do they feel like managers act on their suggestions, the answer is a resounding absolutely yes. So what do we offer? So we offer uh, a web-based um, real-time feedback system. We designed it within the NHS, but with the NHS in mind. So we're both consultants in the trust. We've worked as consultants for 11 years. We know the NHS really well. Um, and we, we know how, how it works and we know how staff in the NHS work. And why us? Well, I guess these are just some of the, um, some of the accolades that we've received. So uh, UH Bristol won the Staff Engagement Award at the HSJ last year for this. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll let you read the others. Uh, one, just one last plug. Um, the CQC report, Driving Improvement, specifically mentions this uh, in the publication from last week. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Anne. Um, can I please, please, please ask you all to go to the stands and, and talk to the companies and also use the opportunity at the break times and lunch time to, to talk to them. So the next one up is uh, move it or lose it. Um, can I please? Um, yes, thank you. So this is um, a, a company that focuses on, on um, a, a movement and fitness of the people above the age of 50. Over to you. Hello everyone, I'm Julie Robinson from Move It or Lose It um, and we are doing a demo at uh, coffee time so don't all run away, we'd love you to join in. So Move It or Lose It, we're helping thousands of older people and those with long-term health conditions to move more, to sit less and help them live healthier, happier lives. So we're collaborating partners with University of Birmingham Centre for Healthy Ageing Research and along with our award-winning range of exercise DVDs, we've developed a unique evidence-based instructor training program that's going to get people out in the community and care settings enjoying exercise. Now, this program combines the four key components for healthy ageing, flexibility, aerobics, balance and strength in one fun-filled class, and it's called FABS. So we're training a thousand specialist instructors to motivate and empower people that are exercise avoiders. We want them to be able to find a way to get them moving and actually enjoying it too. And we want to be able to get them to reach that 150 minutes a week of physical activity and reduce the healthcare burden of eight billion pounds a year that is the current cost of inactivity. 
Now, with a growing network of classes across the UK, we know evaluating our programme is absolutely vital. And we found our evaluations in community and care settings have shown exactly the same results. And an independent evaluation from Royal Voluntary Service have led them to choose us to partner with going forward. So we are at the moment working in the NHS in Birmingham Cross City and providing classes for 12 weeks in GP surgeries uh, for 47 practices and the results from this have been outstanding. So we'd love you to come and see us later and we can share those results with you. So obviously we recognise that we need to move away from the paper and pen evaluations and so have developed an app. So this will allow us to collect data on a much larger scale and also reach out to those customers to make sure that we can keep them active every day away from the class setting as well, which is really helpful with people who have long-term health conditions or older people that have problems with transport. So how does it work? Well, it's really, really simple. There's only two branches. You log in as a customer or as an instructor. So customers can enter their data before and after a class to track their mental and physical well-being. Now, we trialled this in the NHS pilot, and we found that the traffic light system was such a simple and effective way to get people to engage with this. Um, it seems that nobody likes filling in forms. Have you found that? Well, do any of us. And so, especially when they always forget their glasses, and this worked. It was a quick way for us to be able to see more and more green lights at the end of that 12-week programme. And also they can see their own progress and it motivates them to keep on with the programme afterwards. As an instructor, we can record class attendance and we can also look at adherence levels. And we can look at those physical assessments timed up and go, 30 seconds sit to stand, so that we can prove how effective the classes have been. Moving forward, we want to have data collection on a, a much larger scale and look at that trend analysis. We want to share exercise videos with people at home, like our cuppa routine that they can do every time they pop the kettle on, which you can see on YouTube. We want to be able to prompt and nudge and remind them to come to the class and also to have they done their exercises that day and to look at gamification and reward systems so they continue to engage with it. So we would love to hear from you, your feedback, see how we can work with you to continue to keep the people that hate exercise moving more and living healthier and happier lives. So come and see us, joining with our demo, and I'd just like to end by saying, you've all been sitting down too long. Would you stand up and balance on one leg? And it'll look like you're giving me a standing ovation. Thank you. Go on, yes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julie. <laughs> um, excellent. So our uh, next um, talk is from Simple UK, um, Florence. So can I please... Um, have you give your presentation? Sorry, Karen. Simple. Yeah. Um, I'm going to um, share the presentations with with the audience um, after the event. If any of the companies have a problem with that, any any of the presenters, please do let me know. Otherwise, we will assume that you're okay with the presentations being shared. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Morning, everyone. I'm going to try and be very, very quick. I know we've only got the five minutes. I'm Karen Moore. I work for Simple Shared Healthcare. We're a not-for-profit social enterprise within the NHS, and we support the community of practice for flow um, across the UK and beyond. Just want to start, a lot of what I do is, is looking at capability and maturity within the sites that we deal with. But actually, there's a lot of challenges around actually making change. And one of the first ones is actually which technology to choose. Um, there's lots of apps out there. They all promise utopia. What we've decided to do is actually just base everything on evidence rather than just the pseudoscience. So that's what our community practice is all about. So this is the structure of Flow. We're actually an NHS um, org organization owned. Um, the IP for Flow is owned by 
SOCON Trent CCG. SOFLO was actually born just down the road in Staffordshire. The community of practice comprises of some 70 plus organisations in the UK that use Florence. Uh, Flow has an international cousin in America with the Veterans Association, Annie. And we've just actually this week started with Nelly, who is the Australian version of Flow. Uh, GPs have just started to use some new protocols that have actually been inspired by some of the <coughs> community members in Scotland. Um, next step is actually Edith, so we're actually going to be taking Flow further afield into different countries and actually expanding our community further. So the community um, essentially create a number of different protocols based on clinical best practice. As you can see, we're all over the UK. We're just also going into Ireland to work with them on some diabetes protocols. In terms of accolades, Flow has won a number of accolades, but more importantly, um, over the last few years, it's actually our community members that are actually winning the awards. And in fact, just last month, um, West Lancashire CCG won one of the NHS Sustainability Awards in digital. So we're really proud of all the achievements that Flo's seen, but obviously even more proud of our community members for the work that they're doing. So an exemplary patient. How often do you see that? Patient that takes an active part in the healthcare, understands their condition, follows the clinical guidance, it is prescribed treatment and seeks help when it's clinically appropriate. We know of one patient in the room that does that, but how many others do? So what does Flo do? It's really, really simple. We look at your um, best practice healthcare, so what you're doing already. Um, we use Flow, which is a simple text messaging tool that's free for patients to use. It utilizes their own mobile phone to help improve engagement and adherence. And the results that we see are actually better and faster clinical outcomes. So it's everyday familiar psychology. It's a mobile phone. More than 94% of the population have a mobile phone. The youngest patient on Flow is six. The oldest is 94, so it's really inclusive for all patients. Most importantly, Flow allows patients to take responsibility for their own care. Now, I just wanted to share with you some screenshots to show you how easy Flow is to use. It's web-based, so there's nothing to actually download onto your computer, so you can access it from a tablet, from a laptop, or even from a mobile phone. So when you're actually adding a new patient, you can see she's really easy to follow. You add a new patient, add the patient's mobile phone number, their name details, and then the final thing you do is add a protocol. So literally a minute you can sign a patient up to Flow and start to send them either educational messages, you could be monitoring their blood pressure, you could be monitoring their blood glucose, um, or you could give them access to information around mental health. Um, there are over 1,600 protocols across um, all three sets of the NHS. So you can see there we have a hypertension one for GP, but there's also COPD, uh, various uh, um, quit smoking, um, questions around depression. So literally, your imagination is the limit with flow. Whatever that best practice is, we can help you to make flow work, okay? And again, just a quick view of how you'd actually see those readings in flow um, from the patient view itself. And you can see there the interaction of those messages. We use Flow's personality. Um, you'll never hear a patient refer to Flow as it or the computer. It's always her or she. Um, so we actually use Flow's persona to actually make that connection with the patient. She acts as that in-between clinician, that elastic band around that patient um, between visits. I just wanted to share as well, just very quickly, I won't run through them, but just some of the outcomes that we've actually seen. This one is actually uh, from Notting Nottinghamshire, so they're a large user of Flow. Um, just to give you some idea around um, what's actually possible, the types of conditions that are being used. I'll also just share with you some evaluation that was done on diabetes. Um, so you can see actually there is some uh, information there from patients and you can actually see some of the clinical outcomes. As a sharing community, we do have a website. The vast majority of the community um, actually contribute to this with their own case studies, their own blogs. There are a number of videos available and we also have a community resources section. So you can actually see uh, details of those protocols that have been used across the community and actually um, connect with other clinicians. We currently have a diabetes clinician in Birmingham that's actually working on a protocol with another clinician in Ayrshire. So we can actually connect people through the, through the website and through the community. Okay, lovely, thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Um,
I hope you, you're not finding the, the pace of the presentations too overwhelming. <laughs> but at least this way, you, you get a chance to, to hear from um, a lot more um, technology providers. So uh, next one on the list is uh, Amaven. Um, can I please um, invite you to give your presentation? Um, hello everyone, my name's Tanya. Um, I'm from a company called Amaven. Amaven is an online platform that helps clinicians, care staff, and other practitioners to identify and treat various musculoskeletal disorders and problems as well as age-related problems. So Amaven pretty much is a tool that helps people track, monitor, and support various issues. Now this is something that we're looking at for independent living. So this is actually aimed at people who are a lot older. And these are various indicators that through assessment you can identify where there's an issue. Now as you can see there's a red, um, I can't really call it a circle, there's a red um, indicator there and there's green. The red identify the previous and the current. So through assessment, very, 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 very si simple assessment, um, you can identify where there's issues with a particular person. And you can identify what could be a really useful exercise program or intervention that can help that person's issue. And this is just an example of if a proper intervention or a proper exercise program was put in place, you could see results. And through that, you can identify where those people have improved, how you've impacted them. This is just um, something that we look at for independent living and also in care homes. But at the moment, we're working with a trust down in Hertfordshire on lower back pain. So we're working with physios, and we're looking at different indicators for people with lower back pain. So it's a tool that really helps track and monitor where people are physically, okay? Um, uh, now, it's a scalable solution. It's a, something that actually can help people really, really work quite quickly and easily. Rather than lots of man hours, lots of time, it's a real, really simple online tool that can help people really identify issues quite quickly, okay? And like I said, it measures and tracks. You can assess. So the, the, the assessment is done um, um, in person. However, everything else is done online. It provides um, exercise programs. We have um, already a lot of exercise programs in, in, in the system, but we can actually work with partners to develop their own um, program. And there's a recovery program. So we're sort of fitting in the prevention and recovery side of things, yeah. Um, what's also really cool, what's really powerful is the previous slide I showed you um, an image of the person's outcomes or the person's um, assessment outcomes. There's also a lot of raw data and you can actually easily print off reports about individuals, groups, big, um, you know, for example, it could be a care home, it could be a small group of people, it could be a whole um, group of people. Um, and pretty much the key features, it really helps you identify individuals' needs. So it's not just your personal opinion, thank you. It's not just your personal opinion, it's actually really, really goes deep into what that person's individual needs are. There's video-based exercise, so a lot of it can be done in, at home or in groups. Lots and lots of measurable data, and it's flexible, so it can really fit into lots of sectors. As I said, some of it's for care homes, independent living, we're working with um, physios on lower back pain, so on and so forth. And that's a very quick whistle-stop tour of what we do. 
please, I've, I'm over there. Please come and have a chat um, if you have any questions. I do have to race off at lunch because my mother's decided to come visit me today and is arriving from South Africa at 12 o'clock. So I have to race off so I don't leave her stranded at Birmingham Airport. But during the break, please come and have a chat if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much. Um, and next um, talk is from Stranek. Um, Mary, the, the Memrica presentation, I'm going to move to after the, the break, if that's okay. We've, we've got one cancellation, we can slot you in um, so that we can actually stay on time for the break. Our technology has the potential to save the NHS 20 billion pounds a year, perhaps more. It's based upon the same methodology which the European Commission has commissioned as research known as the Human Brain Project. So the Human Brain Project has got 1.2 billion euros of funding to do what we have in a computer program which we can demonstrate to you today. The objectives of the Human Brain Project are, first of all, to understand what the brain does and how it does it. Secondly, to, to, to take that knowledge and develop a new generation of cognitive-based diagnostic technology with particular emphasis upon screening for the complex, for the, the, math, the pathological correlates of complex conditions such as Alzheimer's disease. And thirdly, as if that's not bad enough to mess, uh, <laughs> trying to sell that to people, Thirdly, we can also treat person's health. Um, the Human Brain Project is trying to understand and adapt the multi-level nature of brain function. Now, so this is a mathematical model which they're trying to develop, and which we have in our Stranic technology. So basically, the model is based upon sensory input influencing brain function. The, the brain, through the neural networks, regulates the physiological systems of which the organs are part, of which the cells are a part, and of which the various pathological processes and normal pathophysiological processes participate. Where, we are, where you're at in medicine is that you're giving drugs here as input. So Stranic is a suite of software programs, basically with two emphases. One, to be able to screen a person's health, and secondly, to treat a person's health. The scientific principles are that, first of all, the uh, changes of color perception, or if you wish, changes of cognition, influence uh, brain function and have pathological origins. And secondly, that the brain's function uses frequency to regulate the body's function and the behavior is the consequence of those processes. So, it's a computer program. We've got various publications. I'm author of about 75 publications, all of which are available on the internet to, to anybody who wants to read them. The last one here is a meta-analysis of 6,500 to 9,800 patients, which will be hitting the press sometime soon. It's approved for publication. And uh, what it illustrates Oh, excuse me, I'm just going to skip on. What it illustrates is that the technology is able to screen the onset of pathologies throughout the body at 2 to 23% more accurately than the range of current diagnostic tests. And as a therapy, the results are no less astonishing, 83 to 96% effectiveness. Now, that can only be possible if, indeed, this is based upon a very precise and sophisticated mathematical model of the autonomic nervous system. If you look in the middle, it can even determine many conditions for which there are really not very good diagnostic tests or treatments. So it's, it also has the scope of providing tests and therapies which cannot be properly diagnosed by the NHS at present. So I've put a few benefits up here. The first one is that the technology can reduce the flow of patients into the NHS. Secondly, it can reduce the flow of patients from primary care to secondary care. Third, it can improve therapeutic outcomes. Four, 
it can screen the, the majority of the UK's population. Something like 90% of the UK's population would be able to do the test. And we could screen them for about three billion pounds per year. So we could monitor the, the, the person's declining health or improving health as they go through their lives. And fourthly, we believe we can save in excess of 20 billion pounds per year. I've skipped, I've skipped the demonstrations or the discussions of the, how the results are presented. That can easily be shown to anybody who wants to see it. I've got it here uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so our first talk of the afternoon session um, is uh, from BJ, um, our IT program manager. He's going to talk to us about the um, BCAC technology journey. So uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to BJ. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, and let's, let's restart. Cheers. Okay. <coughs> Good morning, all. Uh, hello, is it working? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, all. Everyone calls me BJ, so if you catch me later, you can just go with that. Um, I have some good blackmail material on uh, video, so that for the next EPR meeting, some of my colleagues uh, will be easier to manage. Now, so quick background as to BCHC. We're Birmingham Community Healthcare NHS Trust for those who don't know. And if we're not the largest community trust in the country, we're the second largest. But if there's nobody to contradict me, I'll go ahead with being the largest. So that's our IT vision up there. And my role as EPR program manager is to deliver a full electronic patient record. And we are trying to do this for 2020 to be paperless or as paper light as possible using technology to deliver this. So in terms of background for our trust, again, for those who don't fully know us, uh, roughly 5,500 staff across a pretty wide geographical footprint. But with uh, programs coming up, TCT and the Birmingham Early Years Service, we are rapidly expanding, both in terms of staff numbers, geographical footprint, and uh, number of patient um, encounters we will have. Now, trying to use technology to deliver this, uh, I found this quote, and I don't know if anybody recognizes this. Who said it? No, okay. It's Mark, oh, Mark Twain. Yeah, so it's, uh, pe nobody's ever opposed to progress, but it's a change we all battle with. Now, in terms of trying to deliver, um, a technology-led journey and me trying to pull stuff relevant to a patient-centered discussion, which we're having today. These are some of the projects we're working on, trying to enable our clinical staff to have real-time information at the point of care. So Total Mobile is a third-party program that works on uh, tablets, which allows patients to have information with them when they're delivering care. Uh, same with Real, uh, Mo Real Mobile, which is a new product, and Stone Forward. And then to allow optimal access for patients to be able to self-refer where, where required, again, linking into some of the items Trevor mentioned, we're working on the development of web-based referral forms, which allows patients to be able to contact us directly uh, doing self-referral. We're working on SMS appointment reminders to reduce our DNAs, but at the same time improve the means by which we communicate with our patients. This is one way at this point. We're hoping we can develop into having a two-way SMS uh, process. From the GP side, there's the program which is again ongoing, Your Care Connected, which allows consenting GPs and patients to share 10 tabs of information within the GP system that those of us in secondary and tertiary care can access. And again, this links into the elements Trevor spoke about of having more information available for, uh, or, well, more patient-centered information available for clinicians and helping improve patient care. 
from the technology element, not necessarily patient-related, this digital dictation, but again, making things faster for our clinical staff in terms of their ability to use the system and enter information rapidly and accurately. Uh, from a patient-centered point of view, uh, now these are things we're looking at in the future. We really haven't done anything with these, but the uh, part of what Trevor spoke about has kind of encouraged me, and we will be taking more of these back to the board. But the ability to hold virtual clinics with patients in a secure, uh, using secure media, which means our staff are able to spend more time with them, there's less inconvenience to patients, they, they don't have to travel as much, and the use of patient apps for communication, wayfinding, there's a whole lot of stuff we could do, which is part of the EPR vision we're working on. Um, patient portals, again, is something we would like. And seeing the way it works with the NHS online uh, element, again, is something we, we will try and pick up and develop, but it's not as easy for us as it is in primary care. But um, the idea of today is to be able to learn from what people want, what products are out there, and how we can integrate it into that top line. Having us having an open EPR that we can integrate with products out there and um, other systems. And like I said, we're open to ideas. We'll do the best we can within limited NHS funding. But the, the key really is imagination and knowing what's out there. Thank you very much. Thank you, BJ. Thank you very much. Um, because uh, BJ um, stopped um, uh, a little earlier than anticipated, I'm just going to uh, take this opportunity to remind you that um, um, Academic Health Science Network's um, online platform for innovation called Meridian, that most of you may know about, uh, is available for you to join and put your innovations onto, which would make it visible um, to, to NHS organizations across the region and um, um, also uh, the members of the public. And, all, um, and also um, Ravi Kumar, where, where are you Ravi? Can you put your hand up? Oh, back there, uh, from AHSN, he's here. He's gonna actually write um, a, uh, he's gonna write an update, like, like a summary of all the presentations today from different companies and um, distribute it to Birmingham Science City uh, partner organization. So you will hopefully get a lot more visibility than just here today. Um, so. Um, I'm going to now move um, on with the um, remainder of the company presentation. So, uh, Mary, can I please ask you to um, come forward and give your talk on um, prompt? Hello, everybody. Long time waiting. <laughs> I hope it's worth it. I'm sure it will be worth it. So my name is Mary Matthews. I'm the founder of Memrica. And we have a personal memory assistant for people who become anxious about forgetting things. And that has a real impact on their lives. Just going back to something Trevor said earlier about helping people to feel in control, not just of their health, but also of their day-to-day -day life, and that's something that we're really passionate about. I just want to introduce you to my mother-in-law, Peggy. She's where this journey started. She was the matriarch of the family. She knew everything about everyone. And gradually, she began to withdraw. And it wasn't that she was ill, it was that she had lost her confidence because her memory was not working well, and she felt embarrassed about making mistakes. She was not at this stage a patient. She was a person who was worried about her health. And there was very little to help her in the market. This is where I think health technology can make a difference, not just in the patient journey, but in the individual person's journey. Oh, I've just gone right to the end there. So, this is what we came up with. It's an app 
that emulates the way memory works by pulling together little snapshots of your relationship with the people and places that mean most to you. We do this partly through people putting information in themselves and partly by gathering data that's already on your device so that we can give you the context in which you're going to meet people. We can tell you the why you're going somewhere and you can prepare for your day with confidence. Over time, the system begins to learn what you need and what you're doing and it will predict what you will need and bring that information to you. We will be integrating with smart assistants like Siri and Alexa and Google Assistant. And there's also a family view for helping family to understand that mum or dad or aunt or uncle is okay, they're still active, they're still meeting people, they're having a great quality of life. There are lots of amazing services and apps out there already to support people who perhaps are more housebound, perhaps further down their dementia journey, who are perhaps needing more intense care. On the other side, there are lots of really great, quite generic task reminders, to-do lists. Also, everyone has a smartphone, will have a device calendar. But those don't give you enough information or enough room to put that information in about the context in which you're going to meet someone or why you're going to go somewhere. And so this is where prompt fills the gap. It puts that context into your day-to-day -day life. We're already um, working with the trust and we are doing some research with Moore Green Hospital looking at how this can support people with traumatic brain injury. So we're at a very, very early stage at the moment, um, but just some things that have already come to light that might be worth sharing with you. Patient motivation to actually try something is really, really essential. We've spoken to a couple of people who initially were quite interested, but actually, they were much more reliant upon family to maintain their daily living. They have to want to be independent. And if they don't want to be independent, this isn't for them. It has to integrate into their daily routine. So the way this is working uh, in the hospital setting is that when um, people come for outpatient appointments, generally uh, the support assistant will fill in a paper diary for them. And in that paper diary, they've got all of their upcoming appointments. What they don't have is who they're going to see and why they're going to see them. So what we're doing is adding that context. So we're, we're enhancing the paper record. And the support assistant can help someone, if they're not able to put this in themselves, to actually uh, put that record in so that people can uh, then consult it when they're away from the clinic. And of course, we spend a lot of our time, or most of our time, in the community. We're not necessarily always a patient. Family support is really important when you're outside of the clinic. And most importantly, in terms of health technology, one size does not fit all. So in terms of treatment, you've got pathways, you've got prescribed routines. For health technology, it's a very, very different experience. People can choose how they engage, people can choose what they want to use, and it's not necessarily taking people along the same pathway. Everyone is different, everyone needs a different level of support. There's my contacts, I'm over there if you'd like to come and have a look and have a play, and look forward to talking to you later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Excellent. Um, can I get, remind me, Care, please, to come and uh, give your talk? Thank you. Clicker. Okay. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Simon, one of the founders of Remind Me Care. Remind Me Care is a dementia and care of the elderly system that supports the person and all those care stakeholders involved in care from diagnosis right through to the end of life. It's, it's a portable care system. So we address 
needs of the care in the community sector, those that we all know, such as the need to improve well-being, reduce isolation, establish a care circle, well-known needs, and our system addresses these. But it also addresses the needs of the formal care world, such as daycare centers, memory clinics, and care homes, and of course, hospital as well. Because as I say, the system is portable. It's owned by the individual, they collate the knowledge about themselves, but wherever they go along that care journey, they are allowing the care stakeholder to interact with that knowledge of them. So how do we do this? Well, we have a set of tools that are activity tools. We call ourselves activity-based software. So we deliver activities. We deliver such activities as reminiscence, a new level of reminiscence as that involves algorithms defining the nature of the person, that this is me using multimedia content. And so it becomes a discovery tool to find engaging content that can be used in acute care management. Um, we have CST, cognitive stimulation therapy, we have family reporting methodologies. We have a range of tools that basically achieve activities that engage the person and collects data, data that can be used in the care process. And as I say, critically, it's portable and can be carried as the person makes that care journey so they can engage with each care stakeholder. So here you see that journey. Here at the beginning of Jane's journey, she has been cared for at home, but there's a lot of different care stakeholders involved with her local authority, memory clinic, dom carer, and each of those can use the system. And as she moves forward along the journey, perhaps now into assisted living, they can access that ever-growing knowledge gained through activities of the person. So they really know the person, and enhanced person-centered care can be delivered. And in the, the hospital ward, we're working with a number of hospitals in the Southwest London Trust, Kingston, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, where they, when a person comes to admission, they can press a button and know what Jane was engaging with yesterday, know what will calm her and cause them not to have to resort prematurely to medication so they can maintain well-being and obviously aim for an earlier discharge if possible. So just to summarize, um, Remind Me Care provides a service in the community that provides connectivity, self-management tools, engages the person with their community and provides connectivity with the hospital. But for the business, because if you can't help a business generate some revenue and prove a return on investment, even though you're providing a cook care tool, we've found that take-up adoption is hard to achieve. We've built a set of tools that assist the care business, the hospital, including reporting tools, reduction of paperwork, and of course, CQC reporting. So it's an ROI tool, as well as being a care improvement tool. Here's some of the clients we're working with, Signature in the care home sector, Bluebird Care in Dom Care, number of hospitals, Chelsea Hospital and, and uh, Kingston Hospital, and um, Nightingale Hammerson, which is the largest dementia care home in London. Um, we're also now in Australia and the US. We're finding that those markets are more res responsive and faster uh, moving when it comes to adoption, and we hope that you'll prove us wrong on that. So we've got a substantial team that are all motivated actually by um, either their personal experience of dementia or their families in care, or their own involvement in the care process, including Mandy Thorne, Vice Chair of the National Care Association, good old Vince Cable, who's back in his um, favorite seat again, and Lindsay Royhan, who's one of the founders of Cognitive Stimulation Therapy with Martin Oral, um, and, and I'm probably the weakest link there, to be honest, <laughs> and um, a body of very committed people to gen generating a system that can help those across that care journey, from diagnosis through to end of life. Here's us. You can come and have a look at the system on our table over there. Thank you very much. Okay. Well done. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so our next talk is from uh, Respexi Home Hub, please. If I could have you um, come forward and give the talk. Morning. Right, five minutes. I can't tell you in five minutes, honestly. I can't give you enough information. However, um, Respexi is a product which enables people to communicate who can't normally communicate for one reason or another. Um, completing the circle, dom care, care home setting, enabling independence uh, for the end user, 
uh, care of the client, communication, social networking, um, checking and occupying the mind. Basically, technology made easier. That's where we're coming from. Um, so why are we doing it? 14 million people over the age of 60. This, this information is about 18 months old now, so it probably needs updating. I need to check the latest figures. But um, over six, the age of 60, 1.4 million over the age of 80. Nearly half, 75 and over, live alone. Loneliness can be harmful to the health of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's quite an interesting figure, actually. I don't know where they come from with that. But uh, people with a high degree of loneliness are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's than people with a low degree of loneliness. Nearly half the older people, 49% 65, say that television or pets are their main form of company. 9% of older people feel trapped in their own homes. 6% leave their house once a week or less. This is why we're trying to do this. Uh, we're trying to enable people who are less able with technology to communicate with the family and friends around them. So, quick overview of the product, and this is very quick. <laughs> you do need to see it to really believe it. Technology made easy. We said that, secure communication with friends and family. What I mean by secure, we use an email system and only people registered in the website can actually communicate with the tablet. No junk mail, no spoof mail, nothing gets through our system and hasn't done in two years. Messaging, organizer, reminder, radio and photos, some of the things it can do. So messaging is email, organizers, simple diary, this is all controlled by a back-end website, and the back-end website, as family and friends, can log into the website and update information for the user on their own tablet. Motion detection, we can fit motion detectors in the house, and they can all be monitored. So you can know if mum or dad opens the fridge door and makes their tea in the morning, or if the room temperature in the lounge is, is uh, comfortable or not. Um, you can do all this thing. Once you have that connection, once you have the internet, Wi-Fi, or SIM card connection, um, you can do that. Separate portal login for organization and user. We have a structure where we have an end user login, which the family and friends use for the website. But we also have an organization login because we have care plan system. And care and companies, domiciliary care, care homes, can actually set up their own care plans. Carer support with care plan built in, saving all admin time. Current, we're doing some current trials and end user uh, in care homes and, and the like. Okay. Um, any questions? I'll see you shortly on my stand over there because there's no time for questions, I know. Um, but there's a, a home page. You'll see the top three messages, diary, reminder are all based text based system uh, and all pop up on screen as a green display. People, you, as you add people in the website, you can add photographs. And the photographs then become a Skype contact connect. So they touch people, touch on a face, you've got a Skype connection. Radio, photos, it's a photo frame when it's not being used. Help is help videos. Preferences, change color, turn on talk back for someone who's visually impaired. And there's also a carer function um, where you do the care plans. That's me. Thank you very much. See you on my stand. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Just before I forget, if, if anyone hasn't signed the signing sheet, please, please, please um, sign it, um, including the companies. Uh, we need to keep that for our records. Uh, so the next talk is from uh, Connectis. Um, if I could please ask you to come forward. I'll put the presentation up. So hello everyone, I'm Mark Howes, I'm the founder of Connectus, and what we're focused on is putting people and not technology at the center of care networks and improving collaboration between carers across health um, and care. Um, so our story really starts with my granddad. It's a sort of a story that sort of is um, pretty consistent in the UK. My grandfather lived on his own 
had done for many years, and as he got older, he suffered from a number of chronic conditions. So he suffered from vascular dementia and angina. Um, and there was a, a complex uh, care network that developed uh, around him to support him that included um, family networks that were either local or distant, um, care workers that increasingly helped with his sort of day-to-day -day personal care, a whole network of informal carers in his community, and a whole army of health professionals, um, everything from doctors to hospital um, staff or sort of occupational therapists, um, etc. Um, and the main challenge that we had um, in was and sort of still is sort of paperwork. So sort of most of the home care sector continues to run on paper systems um, and it creates meaningful barriers for each and every group. So we've spent lots of time with the different users. Um, older people receiving care really lack basic information about their care. Um, care workers um, uh, you know, just totally lack a holistic view of the person. Um, family networks find it almost impossible to um, proactively manage uh, these care networks in real time. Um, and for providers, whether they're in the local authority um, setting or hospitals or care managers, they just lack basic information and can't provide proactive care. Um, so what we've built um, is a platform um, that stays permanently in the, in the older person's home. It runs on a 4G um, uh, tablet. Um, and the first thing it does is actually provides key information to service users so we can bring them much more into their care. Um, it also enables care workers to um, access, record, and share information in real time. We've designed the system to um, use systems that already exist in home care. We know most people tend to use Word documents, so we've got a way of importing what people already use. Um, and that allows um, the carers to uh, you know, record notes and raise alerts knowing that they're going to the right people in the right time in real time. So they can go to care managers. We've got an admin portal for them. We're not trying to deliberately build things that already exist, so we're working to integrate with people like Jointly, Rallyround, and other products like that um, that are already very effective. And we're working with the um, health uh, provider um, sort of networks like GraphNet, like EMIS, um, to plug this information into health. So we've spent, it's been covered a bit, we've really co-designed this with users, whether it's the end user, whether it's carers to really identify their core needs and build it with them, um, or spending lots of time with home care managers um, to sort of do things that work in practice um, and not um, in theory. Um, so the goal of Connectus is really to be interoperable with other systems that could either work on our platform or we could integrate with. Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, provide this platform that allows uh, sort of you know, far better um, person-centered care um, through other things that we could either build or integrate with, make that information available to carers and to health. And we know that sort of all of these um, uh, sort of considerations really fit into the STP model um, for local authorities and health to work together much more effectively. So we're um, currently live and we're taking a very strategic um, approach to our development. Um, and our you know, prim primary uh, focus at the moment is on home care and reablement care settings. Um, so the, the main outcomes that we're sort of targeting are far better person-centered community care um, in transformed regulatory compliance and sort of far more proactive care um, and in lower costs, whether that's direct costs of paperwork or reduced service usage. Um, but these things are complex and it's not possible to sort of build them on, on your own. So we're working with really big credible partners. Um, so firstly, we um, work very closely with Samsung. They've got a big focus on health. Um, and it's with their sort of support that we're able to demonstrate and scale these sorts of solutions. Um, we're also working with Microsoft, so you can be assured that the data is kept in England. We're using things that are PSN compliant. And then we're also working with organizations like SOTI, which provide a management layer on the tablets, and Duo, which provide two-factor authentication. And then um, you know, the, the sort of you know, some of the leading sort of thought leaders in the sector that sort of can um, help to scale this. So if you've got any questions, please um, come and speak to me. I'll be just over there. We're also doing a big piece of work for Nesta at the moment on um, healthy aging. So if anyone would like me to, uh, to, to sort of have some input into that, please come and have a chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Excellent. Um, thank you. So our next uh, speakers are from Kinesis. So if I have a if I could please ask you to come forward for your talk.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Seamus Small. I'm CEO of Kinesis Health Technologies. I'm delighted to be here with you this morning to introduce our product for mobility and falls risk assessment. So Kinesis is the Greek word for motion and movement. And what we do at Kinesis is develop sensor-based technologies to measure human motion to provide some clinical information and health information back to the healthcare professional. So what specific challenge are we focusing on? Well, our, our first initial challenge and in the background of the company comes from an aging perspective. So we're looking at the area of falls. And why is falls such a, an important area? Well, it's a global healthcare challenge. It's quite common, but it also has significant impact on the individual. The likelihood of an injury, potential hospitalization, loss of independence, loneliness, isolation, depression, even death are common occurrences following a fall event. It's also quite expensive, $30 billion in the US per annum and 2.3 billion pounds to the NHS on an annual basis. <clears throat> so what specific area are we looking at? Well, it's really about identifying people at risk of falls before they fall. All too often, patients don't become aren't treated for falls until they've fallen. So there's very little falls prevention going on out there. One of the key reasons for that is that the methods to risk assess for falls are quite subjective. They're based on an observation. There are very little objective data points, time taken to complete a test. They're not overly accurate, and they don't support a robust falls prevention program. So we developed a solution uh, to uh, counter that challenge and issue. It's called uh, QTUG or quantitative timed up and go. And it's based on a, a common mobility test called the timed up and go test. So the product's been developing for the last nine years. It's a registered medical device. Uh, it's spun out of a large aging research program with 22 million euro funding from Intel and the Irish government. And it's a significant undertaking from a research perspective. So it's a scientifically validated, more robust, more accurate and precise way of measuring mobility and falls risk. It's also a fast and efficient way of doing that, and it's also more accurate. So how, what is the product and how does it work? Well, the product is here. So it is a physical device with our software algorithms and solutions built into uh, the hardware itself. So it's a portable device. So it's a mobile gate lab, it's a mobile falls risk assessment, and is used in the community, in the home, in the hospital, in a range of different uh, care settings. So how does it work? Well, in essence, it's taking one of the most commonly used falls and mobility screening uh, assessments used all over the world every, day, every single day called the timed up and go test. Uh, some of our colleagues in, in move it or lose it referenced the, the tug test earlier today. So effectively what we've done is taken that robust test which looks at the maneuvers of an older person's life which could cause a fall, getting out of a chair, walking and turning. So what we've done is instrumented that test with body-worn sensors that go onto the patient just for that test. So it's only three to five minutes. They don't take it home, they don't wear it for three months, and then we look at the analysis. We do an assessment at the point, uh, or sorry, we do uh, results at the point of assessment. So it relays the information from the, the sensors, which precisely measure the patient's mobility. So in the standard timed up and go test, you've got patients are doing the test and the healthcare professional are timing them, as well as observing them doing the test, getting out of the chair, how are they walking, how many steps are they taking the turn, what effect we do is we precisely measure that and compare them to the population. So at the point of assessment, we uh, then provide the results with regard to what's their falls risk, what's their frailty score, we compare them to the population, we also include the clinical risk factors for falls beyond mobility, and we can trend them over time as well. So we believe by using this technology, we can identify people in the community earlier to allow for an intervention. And we know that early and targeted intervention can reduce falls by between 30 to 40%. So moving from a subjective observation to a precise measurement, from one data point to 70, improving the accuracy and supporting a falls risk program. In terms of where it's used at the moment, it's across primary care, secondary care, and in residential care. And by using the, sa the same standard, robust measure across those three care settings, you're improving the continuity of care as the patient will transfer through those care settings. Just a little bit of background on the company. We're a spin out of University College Dublin and that large aging research center. We focus on geriatrics, neurology, and orthopedics. And just to finish then, just to remind you, we are focusing the area of falls prevention by using this precise measure. We know we can identify people earlier to reduce the number of falls, to improve the level of care, and quality of life for older adults, 
to support and maintain independence for our aging population. Thank you, and I'm just over in the corner uh, if you have any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Cheers. <coughs> so I don't, I don't believe we've got uh, colleagues from Patients Know Best here, uh, so that one will have to skip. Um, so the slides from Patients Know, Be uh, Patients know Best and Focused Games will also be shared with yourselves. Um, have a look at them. They're, they're both really interesting. So um, the next one uh, is going to be Data Umbrella. So Jazz, if I could please ask you to come forward and give your talk. And um, also, if our commercial director uh, makes it here on time, uh, I'm going to ask him also to give a 10-minute talk. Uh, so we'll just um, uh, slot that in just before the closing remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jazz Simel, and I'm based here at uh, Innovation Birmingham upstairs in iCentrum, and I'm CEO of Data Umbrella. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that we've done and some of the things that we're currently doing. So a bit about us. Well, we're pretty much a spin-out of the Data Protection Act, and what we do is we're all about facilitating secure digital conversations. So we're all about adhering to information governance and making sure that data is shared securely. So if you go on our website, you'll see it clearly, we badge ourselves as health innovators because we are working within healthcare. And if I want to leave anything uh, out there today, I want you, all you guys to know is we're all about collaborating, so please come and talk to us afterwards. So working with Birmingham Community Healthcare Trust, so we started in 2013 and we've developed three products with Birmingham Community Healthcare Trust. The first one being Medidocs, which is our cloud collaboration solution. Uh, pretty much to describe that, it's like um, Dropbox for healthcare. And in the recent cyber attack that the NHS experienced, Medidocs was the go-to platform that they used to actually share information because they had to uh, shut down all their information systems. Alongside Medidocs, we developed Medidocs Interchange, which is a, another bit of software that allows the integration with RIO, which is Birmingham Community Healthcare Trust's patient administration system. And the third product is SecureSnap, which is a mobile app that was developed in conjunction with health practitioners in the field that wanted to go out there and capture audio, video, and images and share those securely into the cloud uh, for addition into their patient records. So those are just a few screenshots there. We've got the secure login at the top right. We've got the Medidocs platform and the annotation feature that I just described. Uh, equally, it captures uh, audio, which can uh, dictate, go straight into transcribing. And the video was used by Learning and Disabilities, uh, another department which was used to just monitor how people are actually you know, using their service. So a bit about partners. So we're working with Birmingham Community Healthcare Trust as a state, but we're working with many others. But the key ones I'd like to point out today are we're actually part of the West Midlands Academics Health Science uh, Incubator, which we were based upstairs on the first floor for six months. And what that really allows us to do is it gives us access to the whole network within the region, so all the trusts and all the universities. So we've been working closely with Birmingham City University as well. As part of that process, being part of Innovation Birmingham based here, it um, allowed us to be part of the WIRA Accelerator. Now, WIRA are a accelerator that are part of Telefonica. Telefonica own O2, and they're one of the largest telcos in the world. And with us participating, participating in that program, what it allows us to do, it allows us to work with the likes of O2 and many larger enterprises um, because they're very interested in working SMEs uh, like us that are engaging within healthcare. So what are some of the challenges? Well, this uh, figure of £184 million spent on staff salaries was uh, taken out of uh, a 2015-16 report. 
So really, we, we need to work smarter with digital. You know, staff are a big asset, so how can we do that? Uh, we've also got um, challenges with, you know, supporting evidence, uh, and there's a real lack of coordinated digital uh, care as far as delivering efficiency, and that's really where mobile has a, a, a huge role to play. So our solution is Health Vista. Health Vista is a secure patient engagement mobile application that delivers across three fronts. Firstly, it gives a, a secure folder in the cloud that gives you access to all the data so patients can get hold of their patient notes, they can get their lab results, they can get the uh, access to the video chats that they're having with the clinician. And we're looking at putting the community nurse at the heart of the digital conversation so the nurse can be the digital gatekeeper of all the bits of information and what can be shared. And we're also using facial recognition to record patient interactions, and that really adds another dimension of really what can be delivered. So this is just an infographic that uh, shows that there's many things that we can do, but like I said, we're concentrating on the, the three elements that I just mentioned in the previous slide. So the teams, myself, uh, I've got uh, experience of working in many startups. Um, we've got Vijay, who's our technology partner in India who has uh, delivered you know, technology solutions across 30 years. And we've got Saki, who's a chartered marketeer. But really, it was Saki's experience of helping her brother, who had cancer, um, who's just finished his six months of chemotherapy. And it was really the, the gap that we experienced that there was for cancer patients uh, regarding patient engagement. So I'll just wrap up, really. So these are the, the opportunities. But really, what we're here today is the, the ask is we're really here to collaborate with you guys anybody out there that's got solutions or ideas of think how we can work together because really we want to validate our digital patient engagement solution and we think there's definitely a need uh, for patient engagement and and using digital to do that so help us make healthcare better thank you for your time thank you jess Okay, um, our um, next talk is from Brain in Hand, uh, so we're just going to swi switch laptops. Uh, just bear with us for a second, please. We had a few jerky images from the last video, so I thought I would use my own. Um, the slot before lunchtime, never the best time, so hopefully um, I will inspire you. I've decided to do something a little bit different, so five minutes is not a very long time to talk to you about Brain in Hand. So I am going to ask some of my service users to talk about how they're using the whole technology and some of the benefits that they're seeing. But in brief, Brain in Hand is a um, company, we're about six years old. We grew up out of the need to support people with autism and other cognitive impairments such as um, acquired brain injury, um, learning difficulty, um, and some mental health conditions to be the best that they can be and use technology to be independent or as independent as possible. So Brain in Hand takes care of the small things that get in the way of the big things from happening in our users' lives by providing support in terms of accessing the solutions and the strategies that they need to access when they encounter a difficulty in their life. But I'll let my service users talk to you a little bit more about it.
stop the video there. Um, a really inspiring story like many of our service users. We are um, being used by um, about 20 local authorities now in health um, and adult and children's social care teams. We've got a couple of large projects with some um, CAMS um, and uh, mental health service providers um, in, in the southeast um, and we are also funded by um, disabled Students Allowance and Access to Work. Um, so it's a great system. Um, five minutes is not long enough. Do come and talk to Paul and I at the back of the room and we'll tell you a little bit more about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Chris, can I have this switch back, please? So our commercial director appeared and then disappeared again. So whilst we're waiting for him re to reappear, uh, I'll put um, Hugo's um, presentation on. Um, he's he's going to talk to you for five minutes about Innovation Engine Project and the support available um, for the um, SMEs and the benefits uh, to NHS and patients. That's it. Thank you. Right, a whistle-stop tour of the Innovation Engine. Most importantly, what it can do for all of you here. It'll be split into three bits. Those who are large organizations, those who are SMEs, and then <laughs> people like me in the middle. Um, the whole point of this project is actually to bring the demand to you, to help find problems for you. And it's working on that elusive thing of what they call the triple helix, and I'll give a little bit more info on that, but in an essence, Problems meeting solutions with knowledge. You're actually in it at the moment. The innovation engine is an attempt, an experiment, and it's available to both SMEs and also large organizations to have a go at it. But more importantly, it's grabbing communities like here at Serendip and bringing those together, helping small businesses actually better understand your, you know, their ability to innovate and their capacity jumping over to the other side, going and finding large organizations and helping them identify exactly what the problem is. And more importantly, I've also had my own business, what money there is available. Mashing it all together, and hopefully you end up with some business at the end of it, or projects or pilots, which you can then take to Innovate UK or do through other funded programs. As that says, innovation, so what? It's a hell of a thing that you've got to get your head around it. But most importantly, what's in that there for you guys is that we can help you understand what your capability to innovate is. From a small business, you generally know what that is. Um, in my case, my wife would tell me whether we were good at innovating. In the case of medium-sized businesses, once you've got 25 or more people, then you do need a bit of external validation. But we help people pull a whole portfolio together. You can cherry pick the bits you want. You can then use this then for making a lot better applications and understanding things that are available. The large organizations, um, we work with the well, Birmingham Community Healthcare Trust. They're one of our partners. You can see the logos across the bottom. But in the case of Amy, um, they look after all the street infrastructure in Birmingham. We're helping them identify challenges that need solutions. And air quality is one of their points that they're looking at because of the uh, um, nitrous oxide. But there's health-related components that tie into that. If you're then looking at University of Birmingham, there's a whole series of things that they're wanting to try and pull together. Uh, where's Naomi? Ah, hand up. That person was waving a hand. There's your contact for the University of Birmingham. If you missed that, 
she'll be around. <laughs> I'm just conscious, I want to whiz through things here. From the university hospitals, um, what were, as in the QE hospital, are you still there, Alicia? I only just found out she's been headhunted. <laughs> um, there's people we can plug in, but it also applies to both um, Hammond and Shirley. There's others we can all draw in. It's not isolated in silos. That's one of the big advantages of this project. Most importantly, the how do we actually get the money is that we're making a difference on the region and that we're helping setting up new businesses. You've got a place like here um, where in Serendip and you have like the transport systems catapult and serves him right to look over the edge at this moment. That'll <laughs> um, but there's large organizations, Barclays are up there, so if you're trying to access some of their premier clients, we can help facilitate that. Um, you heard from Jazz at the Wayra. So you've got a whole network here, and those that are in transport, you've got London Midland on the rail, and in the other corner, Tata, the people, the owners of Jaguar Land Rover just moved their, their non-car innovation team in. So there's a huge community here and in other science parks that you can draw on. Ultimately, it means that you can grow your business, you create new jobs, that means that new services and products for people, but most importantly, with the uh, NHS Trust, you can swap knowledge. So what is ultimately possible? If you're looking at it from a large organization's point of view, like the trusts, they could use this project, if they wanted, to do things like actually run an accelerator. And we've done that here. Or, if you're talking about, say, with London Midland Labs, who are on that first floor there, they actually taught people internally how to actually pitch and actually sort ideas and take those forward. Loads of things that are available and huge amounts of knowledge. Tough, you'll have to look at the slides afterwards. Um, but if we're able to go and pull in these data sets. We do things with the Open Data Institute, so you can start getting that together. So those who are after funding, you can start actually demonstrating the number of things that you're hitting in one go. That'll do. Thank you very much, Hugo. Sorry, I had to cut your <laughs> presentation short. Um, so, thank you. The last talk, which is not on the agenda, is from our commercial director, Mickey Griffith there. We thought it's important to include it, um, just to uh, wrap it up by giving you an idea as to where we're headed for the future as a community healthcare organization and, and what the major ch um, changes and plans are in the um, pipeline. So if I find Mickey's presentation. Okay, thank you. There's probably quite a few people in the audience who know more about this than I do, but anyway, we'll, we'll give it a go. So rather than just kick off about um, looking for things particularly for, for IT solutions, I've gone through some slides we're actually using in real life for real things, engaging with real people externally and internally. Just for those of you who don't know, this is BCHC, which in terms of our footprint covers the whole of the West Midlands for different services. Here's a whole long list of services we deliver. Uh, we won't go through them, but just to give some scale, we're not just a Birmingham organization. So. Some of you who are involved in health understand a thing called the five-year forward view. Perhaps go and Google it if you haven't. But it's talking about big changes happening in, in healthcare, how we configure ourselves, how we interact with, with our communities in a different way. Um, because there's lots of really good things, but also some things which aren't as good as we'd like. So this is an opportunity. Can we do things better? This is a slide. I've never seen the slides this big. They're great, aren't they? Um, really, if you look on the far right-hand side of that, we're trying to get more out of hospital care and so there are ways that innovation can support that. Again, this is just a, a, the usual pyramid, just trying to move away from very expensive, high level, high input for everybody, more local, self-preferred, self-care. So this is um, a diagram we've used with GPs, lots of people. The reason I put it up there is that we've peppered throughout this are things to do with people like you. So about digital platforms, integration, use of big data, so we're in that business as, as we, um, that's our business. Similarly, looking at how ways that localities work, if you look through, this is a, a presentation I did for somebody else, if you look all the way through this, there are things which are to do with innovation. So innovation is peppered through our needs to deliver the services we need to deliver in the future. This is just a, a, some data we've got ourselves of the GP practices in Birmingham by list size by the federation that they're in. 
So again, we're just having to use and get our heads around data in a different way. This is activity by diabetes in, in, our, in the city, just by activity. And this is alignment of the uh, district nursing teams in support of services that they deliver for um, GPs. And what we show there is the fact that within any, semi, any circle, it, the, the more of one color means that one team serves one uh, GP practice, and therefore alignment is, is, is good. So there's been a huge amount of work, and I can see Lorraine in the back there, to do the kind of realignment of, these, of, the, of the services um, to, to our needs. And this is just data showing how we can use that. We share that with GPs to try and work how we can jointly respond to demand. So I've only been going two minutes and 50, and I've stopped. So <laughs> you all wanted some lunch. So I just, you know, it's just to evidence that we, 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 we've got real things that we really are needing to do, and we need enablers and support people to help us do that. Thank you very much, Mikian. And thanks for agreeing to do this on such short notice. So um, I started the event by giving the introduction. I'm going to actually um, ask Dr. Clive Thess, with our Research and Innovation Director, to wrap it up with his closing remarks. Thank you very much. I'll pass it on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, everybody um, for coming today. It's a big investment of your time. Um, I know that there are those of you that um, didn't know whether they could afford the time, and I hope you're glad that you did. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Hamid and his team for putting it together. Um, it was a whistle-stop tour. I'll be glad to take a breath in a moment because it's been so quick. Thank you. Um, I think that it's clear that innovation and technology um, within the NHS is not going to be sidelined. That seems quite clear to me. And I think our big challenge is to know how do we best use it? How is it best for our patients? How is it most effective for our trust? And how is it best to sustain the industry and commercial base that we've got? And I think that gives us leave to ask a couple of searching questions. So in, in response to today, those of you that are from, from BCHC, did you see something today that relates to issues within your own life here in BCHC. And those of you that are from, from uh, industry and commerce, did you get from this meeting that which will give you confidence in what to invest in in the future? And I think those are the, the big questions. And I think the big question for us as a trust now is how do we flex our thinking to actually take advantage of everything that we've seen today, or at least that which we will be able to take advantage. And I think that's a big issue. And, and I've decided, as these presentations have gone on, that I'm going to set up a short-lived forum for those of us that are from BCHC, that we may ask that question of each other right now. So following this meeting, I'm going to set up a, a forum for all of us in, the, in, in BCHC that says, you've heard this today, now what's going to happen? How do, we, like, how do we make the best of this? And then we want to also feed back to those of you that have presented today which bits of this are going to be useful to us, and more importantly, of the things which are not so useful to us, how can it be adapted to be useful to us? In other words, to help you in sustaining uh, your situation. So that's what's going to happen from my point of view today. We're going to set up that forum to make sure that we take full advantage of what we've heard today. We discuss it and we understand it and we will feed back to you. So I would like to thank you again all for coming. Are we wrapping up? I don't know whether people are still here to show you things. I think they are, but there will be lunch. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.